Love what you hear? Be sure to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight for exclusive episodes, insights, and even our D&D adventure. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today, we're figuring out what that R and rare stands for. It stands for really cool game that is for adults. I thought you were going to say raunchy. I was trying to predict it in my mind. But yeah. No, no. Listen, got to keep you on your toes. If I don't keep you on your toes, (laughs) what is this? Really, really cool game. Yeah, man. Conquer's Bad Fur Day. What a fun game. This is like one of the most sought after N64 cartridges, or at least it used to be, before they started re releasing games like this and making them more available. This was a rare game gone bad. So much fun. Mm hmm. I think really changed the tone and perspective of some video games because you could have adult content in games. But nothing really quite like this, this funny, like satirical, cartoony looking type of game that just knew what it was and knew who they were marketing to. It really was. And it allowed the staff at Rare to kind of branch out, to check some other stuff because, you know, they had already been doing Banjo Kazooie, Donkey Kong 64, and, you know, there are a plethora of other titles that were prior to the N64 and now that we're on it um, that were kid friendly, stuck to that platformer ways. And this one, like, no, 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 no. We're going a little off the rails with this bad boy. And especially to think about this game for the Nintendo 64, where you have mm-hmm. those kid-friendly Donkey Kong 64, Banjo-Kazooie, like you said, those other rare titles. I don't know if Diddy Kong Racing was out by this point. I think that it was, maybe. But things that were, like, cartoony and definitely for kids and to turn around and be mm-hmm. like, hey, parents, you see your kid playing these games? You could have a lot of fun, too. We know what you want, and it is not (laughs) a talking monkey or a bear and his bird friend. You want Conker and his bad fur day. (laughs) Exactly. What a lead-in. So Conker's Bad Fur Day is a 2001 platform game developed and published by Rare for the Nintendo 64. The game follows Conker, a greedy, hard-drinking red squirrel who must return home to his girlfriend. Most of the game requires the player to complete a linear sequence of challenges that involves jumping over obstacles, solving puzzles, and fighting enemies. A multiplayer mode where up to four players can compete against each other in seven different game types is also included. Although visually similar to Rare's previous games, such as Donkey Kong 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, Conker's Bad Fur Day was designed for mature audiences and features graphic violence, alcohol and tobacco use, profanity, vulgar humor, fourth wall breaks, and pop culture references. Development lasted four years, with concepts originating during the development of Killer Instinct Gold in 1996. The game, intended for a family audience, was initially titled 12 Tales Conquer 64 and was set for release in late 1998. The game was remade into an adult-oriented product after it received criticism for its kid-friendly tone and his resemblance with Banjo-Kazooie during E3 1998. Conker's Bad Fur Day was released in March of 2001, following an advertising campaign that targeted college males and frat boys. It received critical acclaim, with praise directed as humor, sound, visuals, and gameplay. However, the game sold well below expectations due to limited advertising and a release towards the end of the N64's life cycle, but has since developed a cult following. A remake, Conker, Live and Reloaded, was released for the Xbox in 2005, while the original version was included as part of the Rare Replay compilation for Xbox One in 2015. 
And so, yeah, a little bit of a pivot there. You see the obvious, I mean, if you go and just watch video footage of this, um, even mm-hmm. if you haven't played it, you can see Banjo-Kazooie and this game being almost so similar to the point where you're kind of like, uh, are you guys really doing something different here? Are you just kind of rehashing Banjo-Kazooie and this kid-friendly thing? Making an adult is a really great strategic move, I think. Yeah, and, and it was at that point, like, you know, you made the pivot early on, but like as we hit the, the 2000s, we do start to see some more, you know, quote unquote adult content coming out. We see some more FPSs hitting consoles. We see the X, you know, the Xbox and Microsoft jumping into the market, trying to be that mature console to combat with the PlayStation. And, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes. Even Grand Theft Auto tried to get their way into the N64 market um, for like the 64 DD. It just ended up not working out that way. But Nintendo did, you know, dip their toes in some of these pools and... This red squirrel was kind of the pool that uh, everyone tried to jump into. And it's funny now because so much of the video game marketplace is mature rated games. And they're some of the most Mm -hmm. popular ones available. I mean, the most critically acclaimed games available. And so this game was maybe a little bit ahead of its time in terms of where the video game industry was at. But it showed that there was a pathway for more adult related content in video games. And so let's talk about Rare a little bit. They evolved from the company Ultimate Play the Game, which was founded in Leicestershire by former arcade game developers Tim and Chris Stamper. After multiple critically and commercially successful releases, including Jetpack, Attic Attack, Saberwolf, and Night Lore, Ultimate Play the Game was one of the biggest UK video game development companies. The ZX Spectrum Home Computer, the platform that the company usually developed games for, was only popular in the UK, and they believed that working on that platform would not be beneficial to the company's growth, as they considered it a dead end. Meanwhile, the company inspected an imported console from Japan, the Famicom, and believed that it would be an ideal future platform of choice for the company as it was more sophisticated than the Spectrum. It had a worldwide market, and its cartridges had no load times. As a result, Rare was established in 1985. Its main goal was to reverse engineer the console and investigate the codes for Famicom's games to learn more about the console's programming. With successful results, the company decided to sell the Ultimate brand to U.S. Gold and cease game development for the ZX Spectrum in the following year. The Famicom's manufacturer, Nintendo, claimed that it was impossible to reverse engineer the console. Using the information the Ultimate Play the Game team acquired from Rare, the team prepared several tech demos and showed them to the Nintendo executive Minoru Arakawa in Kyoto. Impressed with their efforts, Nintendo decided to grant the Ultimate Play the Game team an unlimited budget for them to work on games for the Famicom platform. After they returned to England, they moved from Ashby de la Zooch to Twycross and established a new studio through Rare. They set their headquarters in a manor farmhouse. Rare also set up another company known as Rare Incorporated in Miami, Florida. Headed by Joel Hochberg, the American company was involved in maintaining Rare's operation in the U.S. and contacting major U.S. publishers. Hochberg was previously the vice president of American arcade manufacturer Centuri. The Famicom was eventually released in North America and Europe under the name Nintendo Entertainment System. With the unlimited budget, Rare could work a large variety of different games. The first project Rare worked on was Slalom, a downhill skiing game. The company then worked with various gaming publishers that included Trade West, Acclaim Entertainment, Electronic Arts, Sega, Mindscape, and Game Tech to produce over 60 games for the NES and several additional Game Boy conversions. They helped in creating new and original intellectual properties, including RC Pro-Am, a racing game with vehicular combat elements, and Snake Rattle and Roll, an action platform game with Tim Stamper developing the game's graphics. Rare also developed Battletoads, a beat-em-up inspired by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, and a famous GameStop meme. (laughs) The game became known for its extreme difficulty, and upon seeing success, publisher Trade West published multiple ports for the game and tasked Rare to develop sequels. 
Trade West also gave their own Double Dragon license to Rare, allowing them to develop a crossover game between the two franchises. Rare released three Battletoads games in 1993, including Battletoads and Double Dragon, The Ultimate Team, Battletoads in Ragnarok's World, and Battletoads in Battle Maniacs as well. The last Battletoads game from that era was released for the arcade in 1994, and several Battletoads games were also ported to some Sega systems like the Mega Drive and Genesis. Rare worked on licensed properties such as A Nightmare on Elm Street and Hollywood Squares, and ports including Marble Madness, NARC, and Sid Meier's Pirates. The development of four of Rare's games were outsourced to Zippo Games, including Wizards and Warriors, and the third installment of the Jetpack series, Solar Jetman, Hunt for the Golden Warship. Rare eventually acquired Zippo Games and renamed them to Rare Manchester. According to Steve Pitchford, a Rare team member through the late 80s and early 90s, Rare just wanted to make as many games as they could in their window of opportunity. The huge library of games made large profits, but none became a critical success for the company while less creativity and innovation were shown in them. When the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or the SNES, was conceived, Rare was not yet ready for the change. Rare limited their releases to some Battletoads games and decided to invest their significant NES profit in purchasing expensive Silicon Graphics workstations to make three-dimensional models. This move made Rare the most technologically advanced developer in the UK and situated them high in the international market. Their priorities also changed at the time as the team decided to focus on quality instead of quantity. So making that shift from like churning them out for the, you know, the NES, the Famicom arcades, and now saying, okay, we have the money to invest in ourselves. Let's slow down and make basically the future, the future of gaming. Nintendo's stake purchase allowed Rare to expand significantly. The number of staff members increased from 84 to 250 and Rare moved out of their headquarters at the Manor Farmhouse. Rare also developed a CGI arcade fighting game, Killer Instinct, on their own custom-built arcade machine. Killer Instinct was set to be released for Nintendo's own 64-bit system, the N64, in 1995, but was forced to release the game for the 16-bit SNES system, and had to downgrade the game's graphics. Killer Instinct sold 3.2 million copies, and was followed by a sequel, Killer Instinct 2. Killer Instinct Gold, the console version of KI2, suffered from a graphical downgrade due to the compression technology used to fit the arcade version onto the smaller N64 cartridge. Rare then developed Diddy Kong Racing, their first self-published game. Originally intended as a real-time strategy game involving cavemen, the game was reimagined into a racing game prior to its release in 1997. It was one of the fastest-selling games at the time, as recorded by the Guinness Book of World Records. Diddy Kong Racing also features protagonists from some future Rare games, including Banjo and Conker. At the time, Rare was still working on the large-scale platform game, originally codenamed Dream, Land of Giants, and it was a game featuring a young boy named Edison and Pirates. The protagonist was then replaced by a bear known as Banjo, and Rare expanded the role of Kazooie the Bird. The two characters were inspired by characters from Walt Disney Animation Studios films, and Rare hoped that they could appeal to a younger audience. Banjo-Kazooie was released in June 1998 to critical acclaim, and a sequel, Banjo-Tooie, was released in 2000. It was a critical success, and it outsold the first game, selling 3 million copies. Conquer the Squirrel also had its own game. Originally named Conquer's Quest, it was renamed 12 Tales Conquer 64, However, the new game, as we said, was criticized for being too family-friendly, and so they decided to take it in a different direction. As a result, the team renamed the game to Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, and was re-revealed again in 2000. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, unlike Banjo-Kazooie, was intended for the mature audiences and features violence, profanity, and scatological humor. So yeah, it is an interesting development cycle of, you know, you've seen the jumps that a lot of games make, you know, Banjo-Kazooie went through it. Diddy Kong Racing, they've all gone through that initial phase. And that's where like QA and testing really helps, uh, especially with audiences being like, hey, this sucks. (laughs) So you just go back to the drawing board, (laughs) figure it out, and try and make something that'll sell. Yeah. Hey, so you guys kind of already did this game. 
maybe you should do a different game. And you're absolutely right. I mean, that feedback does help. And I, developers get that feedback in a lot more real time now, where it was probably more like focus groups and stuff like that back then. But mm-hmm. it was cool to see some of these characters start to be fleshed out because I, I know you were the same, but big Diddy Kong racing fan preferred that to Mario Kart 64 back when it was out. In fact, mm-hmm. I don't even think I owned Mario Kart 64, just Diddy Kong Racing. And so when you see like Banjo make his own game appearance and you see Conquer and you see this kind of world building, it's really cool to to watch in real time. And some of those characters never really got fleshed out in the same way um, as they could have in that game, but good that they had that vision. Well, absolutely. And let's talk about that vision. We'll talk about like the early concepts where you know, the idea started ruminating. Where did this come from? So following the success of Nintendo's Super Mario 64, a group at Rare began conceiving and designing a similar unnamed generic 3D platform adventure during development of Killer Instinct Gold. Tim Stamper had planned the game to star a cute squirrel mascot named Conker from the get-go in order to have the widest possible appeal. The staff of Project Dream saw the yet-to-be-named platform game during the creation of its engine, and was inspired to change Dream from an RPG to a platforming game in the visual and gameplay style of the Killer Instinct team's project. Both then-upcoming Rare titles were first announced at the E3 Expo in June 1997, receiving the names Banjo-Kazooie and Conker's Quest, the first two games presented by Nintendo at the event. N64.com reported Conker's Quest being a Super Mario 64-like game that, quote, makes gamers feel as if they're playing through Disney's movie version of Bambi, where Conker collects nuts and battles against giants in huge landscapes and is joined by a female squirrel who assists him as he makes his way through the game. The source reported the cameras being in an unfinished state and journalists unable to differentiate between it and Banjo-Kazooie, although they like Banjo uh, much more. A writer for Ultra Game Players also noted it looking similar to Banjo and summarized that Conker has to collect nuts, find new power-ups in the form of different hats, kind of like Wario Land, and generally negotiate colorful 3D landscapes. He calls its gameplay competent and even addictive, and praised the visuals for upping the ante on Rare's previous efforts, where the clipping is better, the textures more varied, and the overall look of the game is expansive and colorful. However, he suggested its disturbing cuteness, while gaining Nintendo an audience of younger players, would turn off older players and criticize the gameplay of Conker and Banjo for not being original enough compared to Super Mario 64. At the 1998 Expo, it was revealed that the game's title was changed to 12 Tales Conker 64 and the release was set for Fall 98. 64 Magazine suspected the name change was to prevent consumers from confusing it with another Nintendo 64 title, Quest 64. 12 Tales would have had a single-player mode and two multiplayer modes. In single-player, the player could play as either Conker or Barry, where Conker's segments would be arcade-style platformers involving action and speed, and Barry's would be puzzle stages depicting her controlling her dino companion as well as feeding him, so that he can protect her from enemies. The two multiplayer modes would have been a cooperative two-player mode where the players play as Conker and an owl and a split-screen four-player battle mode where players attack each other with acorns. Conker, unlike Bad Fur Day, moved on four legs in 12 Tales. Coverage upon the game's 1998 E3 appearance was generally positive, with focal points including the graphics, characters, content, and the characters changing emotions in reaction to the environment. Total 64 found the visuals better than Nintendo's Zelda game presented at the Expo. Quote, utilizing the N64's high-res mode and displaying some gorgeous textures. It additionally praised its highly imaginative four-player mode and Barry's levels. Journalist Andy McDermott appreciated the huge amount of content, in particular the multiplayer modes, the two different gameplay styles in the single-player mode, and the fact that Conker learns new moves and attacks as the game progresses. Coverage wasn't without criticisms, however, McDermott disliked its Americanized writing that consisted of colonial-style comments and the infuriatingly happy music, while Next Generation called its premise of a squirrel collecting acorns in stunningly unimaginative forests 
a ripoff of Ocean Software's 16-bit platform game, Mr. Nuts, released in 1993. Absolutely. Who doesn't know Mr. Nuts? Ah, the classic. The classic the Mr. Most... Nuts. <laughs> Who doesn't love Mr. Nuts? And so you see how Quest 64 is the game of games. Of course. And, I mean, it's impacted, obviously, everyone's lives. And Rare, as a developer, was like, we're not going to compete with Quest 64. <laughs> it's never going to happen. So we have to take the 64 in the hard K sound out of this game because it will tank us. It will ruin our stock. It will burn down our homes. It will... I see you shaking your head, but we all know it's true. I, know, I believe you. You know, it is what it is. And them trying to rip <laughs> off Mr. Nuts, a beloved 1993 title that we all know and love, um, it's just a shame that they tried to go down that route. Uh, it's a classic, as some might know. I mean, if all of you didn't know, like, our first episode was going to be Mr. Nuts, but... Maybe you know, it's, episode 100. It's so hard to talk about a legend Mr. Nuts. Um, without besmirching it. I think episode 100. I think, you know, because it is the King of Kings, it's a perfect title. 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100. <laughs> I think our episode 100 will be Mr. Nuts. Sorry. That's, yeah. that's a legend has to be born. Reborn again, some might say. Let's get to the writing, which we have none <laughs> of here at our beautiful talks of Mr. Nuts. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. The beginning, middle, and end of the story was done all at the same time, with events written to happen later in the story leading to the inclusion of elements earlier. In order to fit three save files in four kilobytes of SRAM space, or SRAM, the game was broken up into lengthy chapters. Saver's focus on the game, as project lead, was making sure the narrative complemented the gameplay and mechanics, saying just do a thing, like hitting something with a brick, is far more engaging if there's a motivation behind it to disguise the binary nature of the act. For example, the developers originally planned Conquer to attack with a baseball bat. This was changed to a frying pan because it justified the use of a comic sound effect of a metal object hitting something. I don't... I mean, I know this is a Derek side of it, but when people just throw sounds in and random stuff to happen... Um, I do like that change. Like ah, we had this, we had this metal twang sound effect. I really want to use it, so let's <laughs> justify it by putting a frying pan. Yeah. In. Could you imagine the audio guys going to the designers and they're like, "Look, so I dropped a stove and or a a pan in my kitchen earlier today, and I was recording it, of course, because I have to record everything as an audio engineer. You have to. And it was really funny." So can you redesign this instead of a baseball bat? Make it a frying pan, please. And they did it. You know, sound guy, Look, I man. know your dedication to sound. I'll do it for you. At, at least this we guy was doing something somewhat pan. normal. Other guys are like booking trips or halfway around the world and using small, tiny tape recorders at the zoo. <laughs> they, they have no idea what they're doing. But this guy... He's like, oh, my kitchen, there's some comical stuff happening in there. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good comical kitchen? Mm. Next, next game I'd show. I'd watch that show. Again. Alton Brown, call me. <laughs> when developing levels, the developers were originally more focused on the gameplay than the comedy. As development went on, they noticed being less focused on gameplay and more on the comedic premises made the levels come together easier. This essentially became evident with the use of film parodies which Savor decided on after using a Terminator reference in the barnyard scene. The parodies helped the developers come up with ideas for music, sound, design, and gameplay. For example, the spoofing of The Matrix in a lobby chase scene gave composer and audio engineer Robin Beanland ideas for interactive music, where shooting bullets would fade the channels of the upbeat music into channels playing something more down-tempo. So Robin Beanland, I assume, went into a movie theater and just recorded sounds from the matrix, but 
you know, method recording. Mm-hmm. Of course. The Star Wars series, Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992, and Apocalypse Now are among the films spoofed. Conker's Bad Fur Day begins with a shot-by-shot recreation of the intro of A Clockwork Orange. A joke in one of Conker's conversations with the catfish references trading places. The sequences involving the shark bulldog brute parodies Jaws, particularly featuring music cues similar to that of the film, and the final boss fight references aliens as an alien rips out of the Panther King's chest and Conker fights it in a power suit. Conker's Bad Fur Day also satirizes conventions of adventure and platform games, occasionally by breaking the fourth wall. Conker makes fun of how menial his missions are, and the villain's motivation of getting a table leg pokes at the shallow premises of other games. Bert, a metal box in the Barn Boys chapter that stands in place for most of the level, is only there to open a gate which pokes fun at characters in other games only there to be communicated with for the player to achieve other tasks. The explanation for why floating chocolate bars exist makes fun of floating collectible items in other games, where why they float is not established. The death sequences where Conker encounters a skeleton named Greg was an attempt to make logical the concept of multiple lives. The bosses also take four hits to kill, a twist on the typical three in other video games. So what I think really happened here, and I'm just going to throw out this theory. Tell me if it sticks. Mm-hmm. Sure. They, got, they worked super hard on Conquer. They got told, you got to change the name, and no one likes any of the writing that you did. And in rage, like, okay, fine. You don't like anything that I did. All these writers just made everything really sarcastic because they were so fed up with getting the feedback oh yeah and th- and they're definitely making fun of the previous conquer game and banjo kazooie and any platform at that time like making fun of the floating objects the random npc that's just there for you to you know catch a bunch of rabbits and then they're like all right cool you can go through the gate now yeah i mean it's it's great and it treads a fine line because at this point you've had a number of games that have had satirical or comedic characters and comedic things that have happened and it, I'll say this, it goes either way. It's, it's either a total flop or it's pretty funny and the audience likes it. And it's hard to have an in-between with those because sometimes it seems just like, luckily for this, they had pretty good gameplay that went along with this comedic oh, yeah. timing and their movie references and various pop culture things. But it can definitely drag down if yeah, that's man. all you I have. mean. Scary movie, I think, came out around this time too. Like uh, America in particular was definitely eating up the mm-hmm. very satirized versions of media. And so that's pretty cool. Certain story elements, although not spoofing material, took influence from the works of Monty Python. The milk thing, a running gag where the Panther King has to be resisted from masturbating was inspired by a joke just as trivial and banal in a skit on Monty Python's Flying Circus titled Blank Mange Playing Tennis, while a cow was based on the feminine guard character in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Some characters were based on real-life people the developers encountered. Birdie the Scarecrow was based on a bearded rare developer, and Greg the Grim Reaper was named after Greg Males. The Bee King was inspired by a really scruffy man Seaver encountered while walking on a street in Nottingham who screamed at him, Don't speak to me like that. In my country, I am a king. Okay, so adding a little bit more out there, that real life aspect to it. Is it good? Eh, it's something. Let's jump to the more of the nitty gritty. Let's talk about the programming and what kind of went behind it. Got a short little tidbit for you on that. The developers heavily analyzed Super Mario 64 and making Conker's Bad Fur Day, especially when it came to the camera. The staff noticed it, along with Prince of Persia 3D, used fixed views that couldn't be controlled by the player. To make the game look cinematic, Rare went with having a fixed camera that was very zoomed out. To increase the number of simultaneous light sources to four, one programmer spent four months deciphering and rewriting the Nintendo-supplied Japanese-commented microcode for the Nintendo 64's Reality Co-Processor, while another microcoded the support for MP3, 
reverberation, and Dolby Pro Logic surround sound. The length of all cutscenes combined total are around two hours. Marlowe programmed a cutscene editor that allowed for separately made animations, audio files, visual effects, and camera setups to easily be compiled together for cutscenes. However, making cutscenes was still a lengthy process. The editor lacked a feature to preview only bits of cutscenes, meaning they had to be played in their entirety before they could be altered again. This made several small changes, such as text copy edits and adjustments to the timing of speech bubbles to match camera angle changes, very tedious. The testing for Nintendo's seal of quality was strict. Although the game was tested in the United States for five days with no bug notices, it was 24 hours in the Japan unit's three-day test that they noticed a problem of a cutscene in the first level not being triggered. Initially, Greg's introductory scene, which is triggered for the first time when the player dies, was not to be forced in the spooky level, where the Reaper appears again, as the programmers assumed no player would get to it without dying. A tester successfully did. So in the final game, the death scene plays once Conquer reaches the stage. Yeah, man, you can't count on these video gamers to fail. Listen, pro gamers out here. That's what we do. Pro gamers for Conquer's bad fur day. <laughs> the few and the proud. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about animation. Maya was used to create 3D animations. Beanland and animator Louise Ridgway estimated 8.7 seconds and two to three cycles of animation were completed per day. When it came to animation, small details were a priority, such as the fire demons reacting if a swear word was entered into the cheat code menu and the camera shaking and triggering a sound effect if hit by an object. This method sometimes led to tedious tasks, such as having to animate each of several bricks on a bridge separately. Some animations, such as drunk character movements, required research. Animating Conqueror's juggling required Ridgeway being taught by David Rose how to juggle. This is entirely influenced by that audio engineer. It has to be. We've <laughs> talked about so many episodes in the past, the crazy things audio engineers to get sound into these games. And mm -hmm. they went to that one guy one time about the frying pan. And after that, it's like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to go and get drunk and do <laughs> research. Yep, <laughs> that sounds about right. Of course, I'm totally speculating. This is a research podcast. We need to be professional. But the truth is there. But, but this is probably exactly what happened. <laughs> Conquer has 2,000 animations, including 15 idle animations. Lots of work was spent on Conquer's tail, animating it for several instances when he rotates, stands, twitches, and moves around, in an attempt to simplify this process. The tail was thought of as a bag of air. For animating objects attached to parts of Conquer's model, Marlowe coded as if the objects were constrained to joints different from the parts coming in contact with the objects. Conker's juggling balls moved based on his right hip. The Game Boy was attached to his foot, and the frying pan was connected to his wrist. For Conker's peeing attack, only the back of him was animated without his front completed. This was because if the front of Conker peeing was animated and seen, it would have given Conker's Bad Fur Day an adults-only rating from the ESRB. Conker's cheeks were originally animated to puff during his whistling animation, but it broke during testing, and by the time it was fixed, it was too late to program into the final product. Such Immersion a large... broken. Ruined. <laughs> Immersion broken. Should have got the AO rating. Should have been out there. Why can't I see a squirrel pee? That's what we all ask every day. I, just love, that. I, love, that. <laughs> I love those comments. Like, it's so interesting what goes into a character like this with 2,000 animations of just running, jumping, various idle positions, getting hit, falling, dying. Like, it's so crazy what actually goes behind a character when you think of this, like in a quote unquote simple platformer, such as Mario, Banjo Kazooie, all these others, what actually goes into those animations and keyframes and what happens when they interact in certain ways. There's a lot to it, even if the game is a silly, spoof, angry game made because everyone hated your first one. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, back when they were doing all this really proprietary stuff and having to figure all these things out, weren't using physics engines that had been designed, developed, tested, you know, in other ways. I think that having to have those conversations is definitely really interesting. Having to mm-hmm. decide, well, I need to try and reduce clipping, even though in a game with these kinds of graphics, it's it was basically an impossibility. But to yeah. at least have the conversations and the thoughts and try and get things to be as realistic as possible, even in those little details, like with the cheeks expanding during a whistling mm-hmm. motion, you can tell that even though this was a joke game, that they really did care about that stuff. And it's still a rare game. It's still one of the best studios that we've seen at the time that was like, even if we're putting out a joke game, it's going to be the best joke game on the market. It's going to be able to sell and get out there and they achieve what they wanted to achieve. Yeah. And let's talk about that transition they made. You know, Conquer was planned to only take two years to make, but fights between workers at the barn, their place of work, as they like to call it, (laughs) Delayed the process. Artist Don Murphy found the developing game was not very good, and software engineer Chris Marlowe said that, quote, there was an awful lot of content and there were lots of fun ideas, but it just really wasn't gelling as a finished game. Additionally, the market for Mario 64 style platformers was saturated, and another game of that caliber developed by Rare, Banjo Kazooie, was already completed and released to critical and commercial success. For the team, Either something changed, or the team had to split into other barns working on new projects, canceling Conquer. Multiple delays and a lack of updates led the press to believe that 12 Tales had been quietly canceled. Chris Siever had begun working on the project as an artist, then pitched to Rare leaders Tim and Chris Stamper an idea he had, a day-in-the-life game named Bad Fur Day, about Conquer trying to help others, but actually causing more problems in doing so. In addition to having a narrative to give the titular character a personality, Seaver wanted to make the game edgy in terms of its violence. The Stampers loved the idea and moved Seaver up to project lead. Seaver's first action following the meeting was changing the task Wasps and the Queen Bee. Tim Stamper conceived its premise of Wasps stealing a beehive, but Seaver noticed no established reasons or punchlines behind it. He decided to end it with the beehive having guns shooting at the Wasps. The founders loved it and directed the team to eh, make more of that. This set the formula for later missions. An introduction, interaction of a mission, and then an extreme punchline. Cutscene as reward for completing a task. It also changed the style of a game to a platformer starring a cute mascot character into an incredibly raunchy world. According to the developers, quote, we already had the main character, although he was eventually remodeled, and a good deal of code already written. So the best option seemed to be to change the game's direction. Mature humor was a key element. Rare clarified publicly in January 2000 that the game was, quote, still being worked on by a full team and with the same level of dedication as when it was first announced. In 2000, Conquer was retooled into Conquer's Bad Fur Day, with a large amount of scatological humor added to it. So yeah, so it's... One of those things where it's possibly a dead project, especially being like, we put a lot of work into this, but market is saturated. We're going to probably even just hurt Banjo-Kazooie, honestly, if we put this out. So what can we do? And then having me like, hey, I'm a weirdo. I got this weird idea for this game. Let's go ahead and do this. I mean, when it comes down to canceling a game or trying to save it with a kind of out there idea, Nothing to lose. Might as well pitch that idea and Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Starcom's promotional campaign for Conquer's Bad Fur Day targeted college males and frat boys, advertising located in bars, colleges, late night television, and adult magazines. For the Conquer campaign, Starcom won two International Advertising Festival Awards in the categories of Use of Mixed Media and Best Campaign Directed Toward Adult and best campaign directed towards adult males. According to judges, it was also one of the top three contenders for Grand Prix, although Crispin Porter and Bogusky's Florida Anti-Tobacco Pilot Program won it in the end. The campaign included a video ad named Girl Talk, on the website dubbed 69 Uncensored Sounds, that depicts a half-naked girl and a squirrel in bed, 
with each other after a night of partying. For several months, urinal mats were placed in bathrooms of places in major cities, which included the URL for the game's website. Starcom Associate Media Director Gina Broderick said, Like Conquer, our targets focus in on his social life. Being in bars is absolutely being in their element, and because urinating is part of gameplay, it made total sense. And I actually saw on eBay someone was attempting to sell one of these uh, urinal mats oh. for, I believe, $4,000. <laughs> well, so. you know. If you if want you a piece of conquers. history, yeah, there it you may go. or may not be used. I didn't look into it that hard. <laughs> Ooh. From March to April 5th, 2001, Playboy magazine ran its first ever video game related tour. A set of Conquer's Bad Fur Day beach mode multiplayer competition parties at 20 colleges across the United States. Hosted by Miss March 2001, Miriam Gonzalez. Winners of the contest were rewarded with green Nintendo 64 consoles, copies of Conquer's Bad Fur Day, and Nintendo and Playboy merchandise, while the player with the highest score of all competitions won trips to two Playmate of the Year parties at Playboy Mansion. Spring break parties were also held at Club Lavella and South Padre Island's Louis Backyard, the main events being King of Tail Tattoo Contest with free giveaways of various products on the side, such as Conquer condoms, copies of Conquer's Little Black Book, which was a collection of Conquer's Bad Fur Day print ads, and t-shirts with Got Tail on the front and the game's logo on the back. I don't know if the Got Milk uh, slogan is still a thing, but if you don't know, that's what that's making fun of. Three coloring book advertisements were printed in magazines like Maxim. One consists of Conker and a woman next to a tree and around acorns on the ground, with the squirrel's head into her breasts. The tagline is, Conker is a squirrel. Squirrels hunt for acorns. Can you help Conker find some acorns? Subtle. One <laughs> depicted Conker peeing on flames with the tagline, Help Conker stop the bullies. Use your yellow crayon. And another depicted him laying his head in the toilet with the shh, Conker is taking a nap text. All I gotta say is bring back cool ad campaigns. <laughs> like this is, as, as crass as this is, it's such a good marketing campaign. It hits all the areas it's gotta hit. It gives out cool consoles. Talking to you, every video game developer, if you could start doing that more and giving out some cool stuff, that would be neat. And it really parted with brands that worked for its edginess. I think it did really well with that. Look, you got to know your product, right? Like yeah. this ad campaign reminds me of an ad campaign uh, for a few from a few years ago about Manscaped, which is like a male shaving device, mm -hmm. and they did this a ton of commercials where they basically just compared it to like trimming hedges on plants and stuff and made it really yeah. fun and kind of, it just disarms the people that I think are looking at it. It's no longer like a, Oh man, this is like an adults only thing and it's isolating. It's like, okay, I can see the humor in all this stuff. And mm -hmm. yeah, all that stuff being as crass as it is, um, probably wouldn't fly the same way, uh, today. Absolutely. If it went that way. But there's still funny little clever things that you can do. I think the urinal mat thing is a genius idea. Stuff mm -hmm. like that without being so crass, but still funny enough to where you think about that, you know, maybe after you leave the bathroom. Yeah, and advertising evolves with culture over time. It's the same thing like Axe did. You know, Axe tried to push those things. You know, one commercial that comes up to mind is when they are selling like the Axe body scrubber. And like the whole thing is like this uh, studio audience talking to these people on the stage. And it's like, will that clean my balls? And like they would like throw up like tennis balls or like volleyballs <laughs> or like like a huge like just bag of basketballs. Like it's it's a play on the sexual crassness of it. And again, very sophomoric, evolves over time, but works really well with the segment it's trying to do. And I think as far as like a lot of the stuff we've talked about marketing wise, besides Bill Gates having giant parties with tigers and lions, this type of stuff is such a smart way to do it. And you're right. Having urinal mat in there, 
having random posters up at your bar, like in the stalls, or like on the mirror or like in the bar somewhere, you'll never see that again in far in terms of like a gaming marketing thing. Yeah. Like it just, it just worked. And like that studio, that advertising studio that did this deserves those awards. It's innovative. It's interesting. It pushes what the product is. And that's what you want to sell. Like you don't want to sell this in like, you know, a toy store really. Right. Like that's not your target demo. You could put it up. You may get some sales from it or, you know, at your uh, EB games or GameStop or whatever was the time. But toys it doesn't us, work. Baby. Yeah. And your Toys R Us, like all these different things. It doesn't necessarily work. It does work, but it doesn't work as well as this. And it's such a cool way to do it. Absolutely. And I agree with you on that for sure. You go into a Toys R Us, they might have had um, posters up. I don't remember, but it wouldn't really mean anything to me to see a poster for a new video game up next to a poster for like a Pokemon game or something like that. You know, a newer kids marketed game. That would mean yeah. nothing to me. But it means most, something to these people that are like, maybe not necessarily like people super interested in games or like platformers like that. They want that extra adult element. They want something that's a little bit more funny and entertaining and age appropriate to them. So I agree. Very, very And even if, even if you weren't a gamer at that bar, it got you talking. It made those kids on those college campuses play it so they can compete and try and win stuff. You know, it got it got talk. That's what campaigns are for. It's not for you to buy it. It's for you to talk about it and buy it, and others will buy it because of your talk. So, yeah, definitely a really cool way to do it. So let's talk a bit more about the actual gameplay of it. We've talked about that they've got a frying pan. There's some shooting elements to it. There's some platforming. But what's the breakdown of it? Conker's Bad Fur Day is a platform game. Its latest sections featuring elements of shooters. The player controls Conker the Squirrel through a series of three-dimensional levels. The game features an overworld where players can transition from one level to another, although many are initially blocked off until Conquer earns a certain number of cash. Each level is an enclosed area in which the player can freely explore to find tasks to do. The gameplay mostly relies on figuring out a way to help other characters by completing a linear sequence of challenges. These challenges may include defeating a boss, solving puzzles, gathering objects, and racing opponents, among others. The result is always a cash reward, which aids access to other areas in the overworld. As compared to the player characters in Rare's previous platform games, Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, Conker's abilities are simpler. The player can run, jump, and smack enemies with a frying pan. Conker can also swim underwater for a limited period of time, climb ladders or ropes, and push objects. To regain lost health, Conker can eat pieces of anti-gravity chocolate. That are scattered throughout the levels. The game employs context sensitive pads, which allow Conquer to gain different temporary abilities when pressing the B button atop them. For instance, in the beginning of the game, by pressing the B button on the first pad he encounters, Conquer drinks some Alka Seltzer to wipe out his hangover, at which point players can proceed forward. Some pads can turn Conquer into an anvil to slam into the ground while others pull out his shotgun, throwing knives, and a slingshot. They also serve to inform players of what needs to be done next. The people listening can't see, but when it's... It said chocolate right above the word conquer, and I was reading along with you, and I thought you were going to say chonker. <laughs> you know, you eat too much conquer chocolate. You're now a conquer I mean, chonker. Yeah, they could have made that an element of the game. You could eat, like, one extra piece of chocolate and turn it into chonker. Exactly. And to wrap up, let's talk about multiplayer, which I think for reviewers was a hit or miss. I think for a lot of people, it's just a fun arcade mode, but to each their own. The game includes a multiplayer mode where up to four players can compete against each other in seven different game types. Beach, Raptor, Heist, War, Tank, Race, and Deathmatch. In Beach a team of players must go up through a beach and into a waiting escape vehicle, while another must stop them by firing at them from fixed positions. Raptor involves a team of players controlling raptors to feed a baby dinosaur, while another controlling cavemen who have to steal dinosaur eggs. Heist engrossed players in the robbery of a bank, where the goal is to retrieve a cash bag from the center of the level and run with it to the team's vault without being damaged. 
War, you need to be a traditional capture the flag mode or total war, where players have to get the other team's gas canister and use it to release a chemical gas that annihilates the enemy. In tank, players fight using tanks and chemical canisters that release a lethal gas. Race is a racing mode which provides two variations of the same course. Items can be acquired and used against opponents. So kind of like Diddy Kong Racing, Mario Kart, a little small take on that. Finally, Deathmatch is a standard deathmatch mode where players fight against each other in shooting style from a third person's perspective. Players can set multiple options for each game, such as score limit, number of lives, and inclusion of computer-controlled bots or, you know, any of your AI. So, like, a lot of different stuff that was thrown at you. And Mm -hmm. I just think for the multiplayer for this that there were other games that did all of this stuff or most of it and did it more specialized and a little bit better. That's the biggest thing. You don't play Conqueror's Bad Fur Day for the multiplayer. You play it for the story and for the fun. Exactly. And that's what kind of most reviewers have said that we'll talk about is that it just seemed muddied. These were all like almost demos for other games in a way that were fun-ish, depending on who you played with, basically. Right. If you wanted to play like Tank, for instance, go play Star Fox 64, something like that. Mm -hmm, If you mm -hmm. want to play a racing game, multiple options. You can do Mario Kart 64. You could do Diddy Kong's Racing. I wouldn't want to load up Conqueror's Bad Fur Day and be like, hey, Alex, want to (laughs) race if I had Diddy Kong Racing sitting right there? Oh, yeah, exactly. It's like, "Mm, let's play the full game. Let's do that better. So we'll talk a little bit about the setting. Um, That'll just kind of set us up for a little summary of the story. So Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is set in the Fairy Panther King's Kingdom. Wendy is the game's main hub with entrances to most other sections. The Farm Barn Boys the poo-filled Slaprano, Heist, the horror-themed Spooky, Bat's Tower, and It's War. Only one other section requires entering from an area besides Windy, Ooga Booga, which must be entered under the bottom of Slaprano by paying the location's weasel guards $1,000. Obtaining access to the entrance requires going through a sewer pipe only accessible after defeating a big opera-singing chunk of poo named the Great Mighty Poo. Wendy has a beetle-populated area entirely filled with fecal matter, consisting of a big poo mountain and a poo cabin and a river next to it. Poo balls are required to enter the Soprano section within the mountain, and Bat's Tower, which is only opened once the water in the river is drained. Poo balls are available at Poo Cabin, accessible after completing Barn Boys. The dung beetle near the entrance offers conquer poo balls if he can make the farm cow's excrement in the pasture. Doing so involves conquer on the poo cabin's pasture, moving on a big spriggot to activate the prune juice, which gives the cows diarrhea, and using a bull to open gates for the cows to get out, as well as to kill the cows once each one finishes defecating. $2,110 is needed to pay Mr. Barrel to propel down a slope and break a barrier to the entrance of Spooky. Now, Derek. <laughs> so, there's a little bit of, uh, hmm, a theme here, I'd say, there's, in the world building. If you took the most sophomoric, trivial, immature things, it's basically what Conquer's Bad Fur Day is. It's a bit of South Park. A bit of just like all those weird 90s, 2000s shows you grew up with and just slammed it together and somehow made a game of it. Here you go. Look, man, if there's one thing I hate in world building, it is a lack of consistency. Conquer's Bad Fur Day. You will find no inconsistencies. (laughs) There is poo everywhere and you are going to get a lot of it in all its various forms. So good on you, Rare, for dedicating yourselves. (laughs) Dedicating yourself to the craft, some might say. Really, really, really digging deep, real deep into that craft. Like before craft beer was a thing, Rare was doing craft poo. Of course. And that's when you know it's good. Get, Get with the times. So, with that setup, (laughs) 
Conker has a night at a bar named the Cock and Plucker, where he parties with the other attendants that are drafted to fight a war. He contacts his girlfriend Barry to inform her he will be at her place, but a bit late. He leaves the bar and moves into the rainy outside, drunk, with blurry vision and a lack of balance, making it difficult for him to maneuver. He falls asleep in an area far away from Barry's place, waking up next to a farm consisting of a scarecrow named Birdie, of whom he asks for help. Birdie teaches Conker about the game's context-sensitive button mechanic. A context-sensitive area gives him a pill that re-energizes Conker and makes him able to move actively again. The various moves and button commands for Conker's movements and actions such as jumping, flying, and his frying pan attack also come back to his memory. Don't want to forget that. Oh, never. Meanwhile, the Panther King, ruler of the land that Conker is lost in, finds that his throne's side table is missing one of its legs and orders his servant, Professor Von Krippelspack, to solve the problem. When Von Krippelspack suggests the use of a red squirrel as the fourth leg of his table, the Panther King sends his minions to capture one. Conker enters Windy, where he saves the hive of Queen Bee from the nasty wasps twice, and in both situations, she uses the hive to shoot the wasps to death. He then goes to Barn Boys. There he first helps a box get off of another box by feeding a mouse cheese to the point where he explodes. Mmm. When Conker enters Spooky, he finds Death, the reaper responsible for Conker's multiple lives, who provides him a shotgun and informs him one of his ancestors is undead, rich, and living in a mansion around the area. He wanders around looking for the ancestor's mansion, hoping to inherit the wealth, and shoots several squirrel zombies along the way. He finds the house and meets its owner, 300-year-old vampire Count Batula, who provides the red squirrel a dinner and wine as well as shows him around the property. During Conker's feast, Batula tells of his war-crusading forefather, as well as the fact that there used to be a union between the squirrels and panthers when he was alive. A raid of the property by the surrounding villagers occurs, not for the first time, and interrupts the conversation. After Batula drinks a bit of Conker's blood, figuring out Conker is his great-great-great-great-great-grandson, and turns himself and conquer into a bat. He gives Conker a task to catch the villagers and place them into a grinder for Bachelor to eat their blood. Conker is successful, but he feeds Bachelor so much that his body weight becomes too big for the rope he's latching on, and it causes him to fall into the grinder. What a shame. Conker turns back into his normal squirrel form and leaves with the inheritance. Entering Windy at nightfall, when a new entrance for its war appears. Conker walks into the war zone, where it is the squirrels against the Teddas. Although he is not in the proper attire for the situation and did not sign up beforehand, the general accepts him after Conker gets a fallen plane out of the way of the squirrel team's route. The team arrives at the beach, the location of the Teddas' base location. With the context-sensitive button equipping him with machine guns, Conker breaks into the warehouse and traverses, fighting several Tedas, including scalpel-throwing scientists, in the process. He encounters a squirrel soldier about to be shot to death by the Tedas. Conker kills the Tedas and saves the squirrel, who is named Rodent, and met Conker before. Rodent is the only fighter wearing experiment number G7224, a titanium laminate suit that protects him from any weapon, and joins Conker as his Operation Squirrel Shield. Conker, pulling a switch that's in a secret area filled with toxic chemicals and using a tank, enters the underground area Submariner. There, he finds a seemingly little, little girl, but turns out to be a puppet on the hand of a bigger Teddy machine. Conker successfully defeats the big robot Teddy, but not before the little girl turns on a self-destruct mechanism that will blow up the entire war zone in 4 minutes and 30 seconds. All the remaining squirrels escape in time, while the Teddy's base explodes. Conker returns to Windy, only to find parts of the scenery and a windmill on top of a mountain no longer there. When Conker finds Barry, Don Weso, head of the Weasel Mafia, enlists their help in robbing a bank. After entering the vault, 
Conker and Barry find that the bank scene was an elaborate trap set by the Panther King to capture Conker. While confronting the Panther King and Von Cripplespack, Barry is shot and killed by Wiesa. Afterwards, a xenomorph-like creature bursts out of the Panther King's chest, killing him instantly. Von Cripplespack explains that the creature is one of his creations, and that he had planned to use this opportunity to kill the Panther King and escape his captivity. He then reveals that they are inside a spaceship, which he activates and takes into low orbit. From there, he instructs the creature to attack and kill Conker as revenge for destroying the Tedis, which were also his creations. Conker opens an airlock, expelling Cripplespack and the Panther King and Barry's corpses into space, and then battles the alien with the aid of a robotic suit. The game then suddenly freezes, and Conker expresses disbelief that Rare did not test the game properly. Asking for the programmer's assistance, the programmers give Conker a katana and teleport him to the Panther King's throne room, where he decapitates the alien. Conker is then crowned the new king of the land. As the king, Conker realizes that he should have brought Barry back to life when he negotiated the programmers. He then calls out to bring her back to life, only to realize that the programmers have already left. Characters that Conker first encountered begin hailing him, despite his animosity towards them. Conker gives a closing monologue in which he discusses appreciating what one already was, instead of always wanting more. Sitting that the grass is always greener, and you don't know what it is you have until it's gone. After the credits roll, Conker is seen back at the same pub he was seen in at the start of the game. As it begins to storm outside, he drunkenly exits the bar, leaving in the opposite direction he took previously. So Derek... Smart. No. Smart. Um, don't go the same way. If none of you have played this game, it is an insane fever dream. I'll just, that's one of the best <laughs> ways to put it. For a game like around this time where it's cutes and cuddlies, trying to stop a big monster, stuff like that, it's, it's interesting. Any game that breaks the fourth wall like that is usually a pretty insane experience. I'm trying to think of other good examples of games that have done that. The South Park games have done that. Uh, um, Deadpool Gex, obviously did that a lot. That's a big part of his character. There's a couple of like, earlier like, animal titles that did that. And so it's not something that's like totally, I think, totally fresh. Mm -hmm. If you've never played that game before, you've probably played something that's done something similar. But wow, there is like a lot to take e in yes. there. <laughs> or, yeah, it really does start to become a fever dream. You're like, wait a minute. Okay everyone's dead and now i have a katana and now i'm shooting people into space and i'm the king it's like being a conquer in wonderland even with all that mm -hmm. some of the material didn't make it into the game as it doesn't sometimes and although siever remarked that pretty much 99.9% .9 of the game content remained writing wise Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was around 20% longer than the final product when it came to planned gameplay designs and concepts, with material cut due to a lack of time to incorporate it. A few areas that made it into the game were initially modeled differently, such as the water tube and the shark bulldog area Conqueror swims in, chasing a lot of money. Some offensive content was cut by Nintendo, including cutscenes with Pokemon and a joke at the expense of the Ku Klux Klan. The introduction of Conker slashing the N64 logo in half was also initially disapproved by Nintendo, and the developers in 2013 recalled that Rare founder Tim Stamper may have met with Nintendo to resolve the conflict. Scrapped characters included four in the cheese field of the barn. There was Camembert, Ninja Cheese, Cheese Crate, and King Dick Cheesy 3. Oh my god. <laughs> And six drug rats, roach, corn sacks, flowery, doughy, pooey, of course. I mean, I'm going to have to say and it's a shame. Roach. Um, if we don't see King Dick Cheesy the Third in a future anything, um, it's a shame. It's, it's, that's a creative masterpiece, if I say so myself. That's, yeah, that's definitely up there in, in names. In the final game, a climbing area in the Pooh Cabin includes a hole containing a piece of chocolate that's unobtainable due to being protected by bars. This was meant to be the entrance of a section that was never finished, 
and Seaver deliberately left the hole to annoy players. The yee-haw section, which involved three cows and a bull conquer ride named Bugger Lugs, was going to be a bigger level. Conquer would have flown in the sky by blowing up a female cow into fetish outfits and turning her into a balloon, dropping bricks on other cows that exploded into fecal matter. Another scrap mission was a return to the shark bulldog area with the reappearance of Brute and Marvin the farting mouse, who exploded in a previous section. Conquer would have killed the dogfish by feeding the mouse to Brute, then going to a context-sensitive area to shoot the fish as Marvin was about to explode in reference to the shark's demise in Jaws. A scrap conclusion named the lockup ending would have occurred when Conquer beat the final boss and died at the same time. Everything would become static except for Conquer, who would fall to the ground after briefly being frozen during a dive, and the programmers would be heard arguing about the bug. Conquer would then make a deal with the programmers to remove the boss in exchange for not telling Tony about it. Animation for a set of outtakes in the closing credits, a la the end credits of Toy Story 2, was started but couldn't be completed in time. One of the bloopers was the mad pitchfork scene where Conker became annoyed and had his voice turn prima donna. Another was for a scene not in the actual game where the teddy bears had to play dead but weren't in character when the sequence started, which, according to a developer, was to make fun of a tester. A rejected post-credits finale would have had Barry still alive, but as a slave to King Conker. So, interesting array of stuff. It's always so interesting to see, like, the BTS of, like, how far some of this stuff went. And just, like, what made it, what didn't for time. This is such a weird game to talk about now versus then and societal norms and things like those, those lines. Um, but it is crazy to see, like, how much content they were really pushing for this game. Again, I I don't think they really thought this was going anywhere. Like, they're like, we got Banjo-Kazooie. We're going to do another one. It did really well. Let's do another one. And this one's like, mm, let's just get as deranged and weird as possible. Yeah. I mean, you got to earn that paycheck, right? You got to justify your day. So you're like, oh, guess I'll make another poop guy. <laughs> Can't believe that one I of guess- the poop guys got cut. I I know. How do you do that to a poop guy? Well, there couldn't have been that much more to add to his character, right? Like, you could take a model from one of the other 7,000 poop things that you've made, (laughs) give this one some eyeballs, done. Did it. Yeah, pretty much. But I don't know. It's it's interesting. I I do want to talk about the music and sound that we have in there, because obviously we've talked about it. If they're putting the frying pan in, this game's going to be all about that. So let's break Let's break it down and how they put this all together. The inclusion of voice acting, in addition to the adult content, was another method by Seaver of differentiating Conker's Bad Fur Day in the Nintendo 64 marketplace. The idea initially garnered skepticism from a few staff members who argued it was too much work. But Seaver explained that for Beanlin, it was like laying down a challenge, one we both accepted and relished. For making each mission scenario, voice recording came first. Beanlin recalled one session lasting an hour. Seaver described the voice recording process in him and Beanlin having some fun with stupid voices. The vocal track meant Conker's Bad Fur Day required a 64 megabit cartridge, one of the few Nintendo 64 games that size. Audio made up around 40 to 48 megabytes of all cartridge space. So sound was basically two thirds of this cartridge and the other third was the whole game. The further we get into this episode, the more I'm starting to suspect that my theories are true. This audio (laughs) engineer guy was running the show. 40 to 48 of 64 megs. I mean, all on the sound. That guy was like, it needs more frying pans. <laughs> if it doesn't have any frying pans here, the game is ruined. It's insane. I mean, we're getting back to it, too, because he's going to tell you more about it. Except for the great Mighty Pooh, all of the male characters, including Conker, and two female characters were voiced by Seaver, with all other female characters voiced by the animator, Luis Ridgway. So Seaver is basically Taika Waititi. Just always yes. throws and, himself in, like, eh, I could do this. Yeah, and then you have, you know, 
They're like, hey, we'll give you a shot. We know you came out as an artist. You can be a lead. Oh, you want to do everything? Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> I was elected to lead, not to read, Derek, mm. as the great spoof character in the Simpsons movie of Arnold Schwarzenegger says. That's what Seaver said. I think he really did read that line. <laughs> I think he did. And it's fantastic. Routines of the Jerky Boys influence the voice direction, such as the New York accent on the Nasty Wasps. For Barry, Ridgway was directed to use an American accent. She recalled in 2015 that she'd never been anywhere in my life. I'd just flown over from Dublin. So all I could think was to add, like, so often. Seaver and Beanland had difficulty coming up with voices for the Ugas. They initially tried to make them sound like the cavemen in At the Earth's Core from 1976, but were unsuccessful and ultimately decided to do random grunts and fast word saying. For music tracks where the instruments playing change depended on location, volumes of different MIDI channels were programmed to go up or down. One MIDI file was limited to 16 channels, so in order to have 32 MIDI channels for as much variation as possible, audio software engineer Mike Currington conceived having two MIDI files sync up with each other, with the intro to its war replicating the chaotic audio of Saving Private Ryan its bullet hit sounds were programmed as MIDI notes with much panning taking advantage of the game's surround sound. The Great Mighty Pooh was performed by Marlowe, who had experience in opera. Recorded in a single afternoon, Soprano, the song the character sings, was written by Seaver and composer Robin Beanland specifically to incorporate Marlowe's operatic talents. Soprano was also originally going to have the Sweet Corn be backing singers, with Ridgway and another animator, Ailing Duddy, voicing them. The only 12 Tales piece included in Conker's Bad Fur Day was the one where Conker is peeing on his enemies. Yep, that's great to bring over. Got to <laughs> again. Got to keep that I sound. Right. Look, I poured a glass of water on the kitchen floor today, and I recorded it. You need to animate pee. The game will I, fail. I think you're, you're, you're. Your thoughts are correct. Audio I, engineers I, I are nuts, think man. Seaver was like, listen, I came in as an animator and an artist, but really, <laughs> I'm truly an audio tech. It's at heart. And, you and I will take this project over. He had a little bit of a diva thing going on for sure because oh, these yeah. two other people tried to get in as some backing singers and Seaver was like, no, 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 no I don't no, think no. that's going to happen. I'm sorry. You, Not maybe you could have done one of these other 75 characters I did, but I already did them. <laughs> I already did them. Oh, and, you uh, want to be Pooey, the character? Oh, sorry, we cut him. Oh, he's, he's gone. <laughs> uh, uh, what a shame. You already recorded lines? You, you spent eight hours recording? Uh, it sucks. Sorry. Yeah, I feel like I there could be the a, a game about Rare as a studio, its own satirical game with a horrible, mm -hmm. horrible boss. Just taking full credit for everything. It'd be amazing. That would be interesting. I would definitely like to see like more of like the BTS of like these early scrappy studios in the 90s and 2000s and just how that stuff came about before corporations took over. Yeah. I'm on board with that. I feel like it could have been something like that uh, bomb game from the Jackbox titles. You know, something mm -hmm. like that. That would be a lot of fun. Oh, I'd love it. All right, let's talk about... I don't know everything about Conquer because I'm trying to like find like a safe section for me to like cleanse my brain. And there's really none of that thus far. <laughs> but let's talk about the release versions and how it got its rating. You don't want to talk about poop anymore? Listen, I'm sorry. I thought this was a poop cast. Is it not? Ooh, that's a whole different category, my friend. <laughs> I'm going to have to consider changing clean to dirty on this one whenever I post it. But we'll see. <laughs> Dirty, in parentheses, comically. <laughs> Conker's Bad Fur Day received an M, or mature rating, from the ESRB for reasons of animated violence, mature sexual themes, and strong language, becoming the second Nintendo-published M-rated title after another rare-developed game, Perfect Dark. Nintendo's move into adult titles was to keep the interest of consumers who played the company's titles when they were younger. Nintendo of America spokeswoman Perrin Kaplan explained that, quote, the kids who were six when they were playing the first Mario games 
are now 26. Less than a year before Conker's release, 18-year-olds and over made up 58% of console players. Those in the 35-plus age group, 21%. This demographic change was due to the success of adult-oriented PlayStation franchises like Tomb Raider and Resident Evil, and it meant it wouldn't be enough for Nintendo to compete with Sony entirely on children's properties. Because Nintendo was known for its family-friendly games, in 2000, around three-quarters of revenue were from sales of child-friendly video games, Conker's Bad Fur Day was the subject of controversy. According to Rare, quote, Nintendo initially had concerns regarding this issue because kids might be confused that this product was aimed at them. The LA Times claimed some parents used to Nintendo's family-friendly games are horrified, reporting a mother in Shurerville, Indiana, who bought the game for her 15-year-old son. Quote, This is disgusting. Sophomoric humor. And I'm disappointed in Nintendo. It's like Disney released pornography. I think that's what she sounds like. Which they definitely did do that. So Yeah. <laughs> Nintendo of America declined to acknowledge the game in its Nintendo Power magazine, although other official Nintendo publications outside the U.S. did cover the game, and copies of the magazine's strategy guides were packaged in black poly bags with warnings similar to the ones in the covers of art imposed on them. KB Toys, rest in peace, which specialize in toys and video games for children, also refused to sell the game. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was released on March 5th, 2001 in North America. In Europe, the game was published and distributed by THQ on April 13th, 2001, after Nintendo of Europe declined to publish it. It was the highest-selling mature-rated video game in its first month of release, and its website garnered 300,000 unique visitors in the first two weeks on the market. However, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was not a commercial success, selling only about 55,000 copies within its first month of release. Potential reasons included its prohibitively high cost, advertisements exclusive to the older audience, and release near the end of Nintendo 64's commercial life. As of February 2020, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is the fourth rarest Nintendo 64 title, with copies selling on bidding sites for around $500 to $700, and its value was affected by its unusual genre, poor initial sales, costly 64 megabyte cartridges being released near the end of the Nintendo 64's lifespan, and several leftover copies purchased upon live and reloaded's release. After the release of Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, Rare began development of a direct sequel referred to as Conqueror's Other Bad Day. Seaver revealed that the game would deal with Conqueror's somewhat unsuccessful tenure as king. He spends all the treasured money on beer, parties, and hookers. Thrown into prison, Conqueror is faced with the prospect of execution, and the game starts with his escape, bail, and chain attached from the castle's highest tower. In 2002, however, Rare was purchased by Microsoft, who told them that they were not interested in such a project. A remake of Conker's Bad Fur Day, titled Conker Live and Reloaded, was ultimately released for the Xbox in 2005 to generally favorable critical reception. Developers noted that it was difficult to port the game to the Xbox system because Bad Fur Day's microcoded performance optimizations had been deeply customized for the N64 hardware. Live and Reloaded features updated graphics and a multiplayer mode that supports the Xbox Live service. Additionally, some aspects in the single-player mode were adjusted. Several minor obscenities within the voice dialogue that are present in the Nintendo 64 game were censored at Microsoft's request. The camera control was refined and improved with a zoom function, and an auto-targeting system was added to the game. After the release of Live and Reloaded, Rare began work on another game in the Conquer universe titled Conquer getting medieval. The game was to be multiplayer focused and did not feature Conker as a main character, with Rare instead hoping to focus on other characters in the series, but the game was ultimately canceled. Conker returned in a new episodic campaign for the sandbox game Project Spark. The campaign, titled Conker's Big Reunion, is set 10 years after the events of Bad Fur Day and Seaver reprised his voice roles. The first episode of the campaign was released in April 2015, but the remaining ones were canceled the following September. Conker's Bad Fur Day is also included as part of the Rare Replay compilation for Xbox One, marking the original game's first official re-release. 
The compilation was released on August 4th, 2015. So you're telling me that the other Conquer game that would be multiplayer only would have just been a bunch of poop and then Conquer would have been a side character because that's all the characters in the game, apparently? <laughs> I don't know how you call it a Conquer game. At the, like, don't call it that. Have Conquer in it. You had other games and other characters. Yeah. Bring back the, like crocodile guy and a little turtle and whatever else like yeah or or do it like a cinematic universe like nintendo does with all of like their key properties where like mario fights yoshi and link and samus like bring back like the diddy kong racing esqueness of it exactly but, you know what derek we'll never know unfortunately we will never know that's maybe for the best Conqueror's Bad Fur Day received critical acclaim with an aggregate review score of 92 out of 100 at Metacritic based on reviews from 19 critics. Claimed IGN editor Matt Casamassina in his 9.9 out of 10 review, not only is it quite possibly the most hilarious title ever created, but the selection of crude jokes, over-the-top violence, and sexual content featured is only one-upped by the game's remarkably deep, well-paced level design, tightly knit control mechanics, beautiful graphics, and amazing sound quality. Many publications and websites declared the graphics were the best on the Nintendo 64. Chris Slade of Next Generation wrote that the title has the usual rare qualities of top-notch graphics and incredible worlds. Official Nintendo Magazine described even the gross-out levels as drop-dead gorgeous. That's some gorgeous poop, you might say. <laughs> that is an official Nintendo perspective <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and exclaimed that the amazing detail on the brilliant film spoof stages take our beloved nintendo n64 to new heights of visual pleasure critics noted that the game featured a number of technical effects that were uncommon at the time especially for an n64 game such as varied and crisp textures dynamic shadowing colored lighting large areas with a long draw distance, no distance fog, detailed facial animations, lip syncing, and individually rendered fingers on some characters. GameSpot went so far as to say that the game makes other Nintendo 64 games look like 16-bit software. Casamassino praised the detailed 3D worlds. Fantastic, he says. He remarked that Conker himself is equipped with an in-game facial animation system that realistically portrays his different moods as he travels the lands. When he's scared, he looks at it, and when he's pissed off, players will actually be able to see his teeth showing in a frown. Reviewers noted occasional frame rate drops, but most agreed they did not interfere with the gameplay. And, and Derek, as we talked about, what's this game about? What's those 40-some-odd those megs about? The audio. All about that sound, baby. <laughs> and the game's audio. That audio. That audio. The game's audio and diverse vocal track were widely praised. Critics credited the voice acting for its different accents and styles, with cleverly lewd scripts and dead-on movie spoofs. Nintendojo noted certain voices sounding identical to film characters being spoofed. Top notch. The soundtrack was praised for sounding clear for a cartridge title its use of arrangement variation based on player location, and rich and creative instrumentation. Reviewers also highlighted the high number of sound effects, such as Conker's footsteps, changing sound effects during step-by-step, -step, and how they benefited the setting, so changing based on your floor texture. Most reviewers agreed the jokes were clever, funny, and well-delivered, and GamePro felt the wildly diverse weird missions were sublime satirical genius making up for the linear gameplay. However, some criticized the humor for being juvenile, misogynistic, and overfilled with profanity and bodily humor, and Slate felt the shock effect would go away within an hour. Seth Stevenson of Slate Magazine called an example of the lack of actual mature console games for socially adjusted, non-outcasted adults who enjoy video games, Derek. Official Nintendo Magazine described Conker's Bad Fur Day as a monster-sized game. Either you'll die laughing well before the end, or it will take you months of dedicated gameplay to reach it. The gameplay was highlighted for its unconventional context-sensitive paths. Casamassina noted that they help keep the action shifting, refreshing, and always exciting, and credited Rare for reducing the number of items to collect. Game Revolution's Johnny Liu, 
positively described the gameplay as a staccato flow between gameplay and cutscenes. While there's only one path to traverse the game's big world, the enjoyment came in thinking what to do next. Slate wrote its diverse set of bizarrely creative scenarios motivated gamers. He was, however, bothered by the game's lack of clear direction on where to go, which resulted in long-length wonders that only ended in stumbling upon the next required area and felt that many puzzles lacked logical coherence and depended too much on trial and error. Edge remarked that the pads make Conqueror's Bad Fur Day little more than a procession of barely connected and mini minigames. Criticism was also targeted at the game's erratic camera system, simplistic action, short length, and linear nature. N64 Magazine felt that the camera system does not allow players to properly judge their position within their surroundings, and GameSpot remarked that it can get caught on objects or refuse to obey commands. The San Francisco Chronicle reported the camera being occasionally immovable and getting into frame objects that block the player's view, making worse an experience where the character is difficult to control, especially when required to jump onto small areas. Yes. This is one thing that I am so glad games were able to figure out and fix because it is so horribly frustrating. Mm -hmm. When you're playing a platformer game and for whatever reason they have you set at like an offset angle, and then on top of that, when you tried to move, I think back then it was usually the C buttons, you would try and move it back in a frame and it would totally shift the other way. And yeah, you could see more from that angle, but when you're trying to line things up and you're trying to do like precise platforming, it was a really frustrating uh, part of this console in this era. It was. And if you didn't grow up with it and you try and go back and play it now, it's insanely frustrating because it was on this weird 3D plane where they're still figuring out 3D and you can't really gauge the jump sometimes. You're like, I think I have to move the stick that far and like jump that far, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things that they talked about was how the differences in each of these pads basically create this really unique style of gameplay from place to place within the game. I find that really interesting in video games. I, I found myself in the past playing a game and thinking like, wow, they really like built in this one thing for this one specific mission or whatever. Like in Grand Theft Auto V, there's a mission where you have to do yoga and it's about like balancing out mm -hmm. particular sticks to do yoga. And I'm thinking, wow, someone really took the time to do that. Of course, you could, I think you could do yoga after you do that mission yeah. or whatever, but it's just interesting to think about someone having to program just one specific action for one specific part of a game. Yeah, that, that has no bearing on it. That really does not change any of the course for that. That could have, in GTA's standard with that, that could have just been a cutscene because it basically builds towards that. Exactly. And it allows you to be interactive with it and makes it part it makes it still interesting it wasn't something like i wouldn't go back and do it but it was still that nice one-off thing to like add into this cutscene that's going to play out with all those interesting aspects of it as you're michael in the game and again when games can do that and when they go over the top for some of this stuff for like conquers for like they really could have phoned this game in they honestly could have just phoned this game in kept some of the, just like the humor and just ran off the humor but they ran off both of them, uh, gameplay and humor. Yep. So lastly, the multiplayer modes garnered mixed responses. Casa Messina and Game Planet considered them inventive and praised the numerous options, adding longevity to the product. On the other hand, GameSpot stated that most modes failed to stand the test of time, and Lou, although stating they were a welcome bonus, considered them to be filler also criticizing that the responsiveness and control setup of the single-player mode was not suitable for the fast pace of the multiplayer battles. I could see that. And this is also the era where, like, multiplayer was a tack-on for a lot of games. It was oh, just yeah. an aside, because all the things you do in there are basically things you do in the main multi or main, excuse me, main single-player of the game. So it just kind of, yeah. like, adds those levels and those ideas onto what you did before, just with friends, which, again... I, I, I think that's probably the best thing. It's a welcome bonus, but it's definitely filler. Like, yeah, and it's, 
it really you're absolutely right that they did just tack this stuff on mm -hmm. so much like golden eyes multiplayer that made it so so famous just a little tack on yep. at the end yeah because of development same thing with another rare property is like you are playing through levels that are part of the single player levels that are cut off and adds that element of basically what you're going to do in the main game just four people are doing it now uh, again i i think rare at this time as much as multiplayer was out there, kind of knew how to tack on multiplayer to a single player game. And this, again, I think being, a, again, a welcome bonus, but filler was the best way to describe this versus some of these other games like GoldenEye that was an FPS that carried on being an FPS in the multiplayer versus Conquer, which kind of deviated to everything. And it really is interesting that that perspective has definitely reversed. Mm -hmm. Everything now is about what is the online capabilities you know that that's yeah. why people some games don't even have single player campaigns anymore yeah. and so there was definitely a big switch at some point in the industry and it's always interesting to think about yeah exactly i mean it's chasing the money once you get to it it's sadly chasing the money but let's talk about what conquers bad fur day or cbfd as we in the industry call it uh did with award wise <laughs> so Conquer's Bad Fur Day was awarded Nintendo 64 Game of the Month by IGN. It won Best Sound at the 2001 BAFTA Interactive Entertainment Awards, Best Platform Game at the GameSpot Best and Worst of 2001 Awards, and Best Anthropomorphic Game at the Furry Media Awards Ceremony Ursa Major Awards. In later years, Conquer's Bad Fur Day has been called by professional gaming critics one of the best video games of all time one of the best and greatest Nintendo games, and one of the best N64 titles. In Uproxx's 2021 list of top 100 N64 games, based on 250,849 user ratings from various websites, Conker's Bad Fur Day came in at number 12. It ranked number 6 both on a list of rare games by Shaq News in 2018, and a ranking of best games featuring on Rare Replay by Jinx TV. So a variation of it. I mean, obviously, at the time, in 01, winning some good awards, and then coming into, like, later years, in the 2010s, 2020s, on those retrospective looks, still up there. Still up there in S64 games, but still up there in games in and of itself. And I think it definitely fits up there for N64 games in particular, um, just because... There were a lot of games for the N64. So many of them are those like classic, classic Nintendo IP titles. And so there wasn't always a ton of characters, you know, outside of that realm of games that were making really good, iconic games. The ones that were, you always knew right away if it was a hit or not. But I've seen buckets and buckets of N64 cartridges of just really not so successful games that you know, use game stores, want to get rid of for a dollar, basically. Yeah, and, and to try and scrape those out. And unfortunately, as we had talked about in some of the release versions, wasn't a lot for Conquer in the future. They tried. They tried to bring it out. But again, like we had discussed earlier, just all these factors, late life cycle, mature only at the time, crass humor that wasn't evolving with it. It just hit this trifecta of not being able to carry it over so well. And then Microsoft's acquisition of Rare kind of squandered or squashed that. And Microsoft's like, mm, you're corporate now. We can't do these like random weird things. You guys got to kind of follow some guidelines. And we're not necessarily <laughs> family friendly, but we are in terms of some of the things that you say. Yeah, I know that you guys were at Bill Gates' lion party thing, <laughs> but that was kind of the Wild West. Kind of the Wild our, West. Uh, we're getting this all figured out now. You got to settle yourselves down just a little bit. Exactly. We'll give you Pooh Mountain. Give you, but <laughs> give you Pooh Mountain, it. but that's where we strike the line in the turd. We're, you have to cut Pooey. Pooey can't be in there. It's too much. And it's unfortunate. <laughs> and what's unfortunate is, Derek, we are wrapping up our episode. We're coming to the end of Conker's Bad Fur Day. As always, let the people know, why did we choose this game and what do you think? I think that it's a really fun game, and that's all. I mean, you and I talk about all different kinds of games, 
not only from a gameplay perspective, but also just from a story perspective. Mm-hmm. And this is one that's just fun to talk about. All those elements of an interesting development cycle without it being, you know, constant delays and constant roadblocks. They took a bad reaction and turned it into a really great game. And so, you know, for me, this game was probably a little bit ahead of my time. But then when I went back and, you know, emulators and stuff like that, which I've never, ever used Nintendo, if you're wondering. But as soon as they did come out and there were opportunities for other people to play this game that I could watch Mm -hmm. on the Internet, um, you really do see how much fun this game was um, in its original glory. And so for me, the game is like a seven out of 10. Yeah. I personally found those, uh, the game's very, very funny, a lot of fun. The platforming style of game, kind of the golden era for me was like Mario 64. Mm -hmm. And I always struggled a little bit with like Banjo Kazooie, um, Conker's Bad Fur Day as well, just with some of the issues in those camera angles that. Mario 64 had some of those things, too, as well, I will admit. But um, for whatever reason, it wasn't as frustrating as getting hit and hurt in some of the rare titles in the same way. So 7 out of 10 for me. What about you? Okay, okay. Understandable. That's a number. Um, No, I have to agree with the way movement. So the way in, like, modern gaming, the way that Titanfall kind of set the standards for fluid movement I think Mario 64 kind of set the standard for movement in a 3D platformer. Um, having a triple jump, having back jumps, having the skahoo jump where you fly from like crouching into a jump. Oh, the, the skahoo jump. That is my go to. It's a good one. I travel a lot of ground. Exactly. And so having this variety really. Jump over Poo Mountain. <laughs> if, listen, if you had it, you could. But that set the variety um, and set the standard. And no one. I don't think anyone came really close to Mario, and I think everyone understood that. I think everyone took ideas from it, but even in marketing, if it's like, we're there to challenge Mario, no, you're not. You can't. Like, it's perfection in terms of movement. It's perfections in what it was doing at the time. And like you said, camera angles were still trying to get figured out in 3D because there were plenty of frustrating camera angles in that game. But... When you look at these others that have all of those same trials and tribulations when it comes to cameras and other things, but they don't have as much advanced movement and variety. Conkers understands that. And I think they knew that going in. We're like, we're simplifying the gameplay to allow our ridiculous humor and our level design and the story of what's going on shine through. Let's go more basic to go on this other end and let's add voiceover let's add more music and sound effects than mario has because mario's wahoo and a little blah 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 blah, that's about as far as we get and then princess peach inviting mario to the castle like that's that's pretty much the dialogue we get whereas this whether it is in vain of taking up 40 megs or if it pays off with it and i think it did a best of both worlds um, you know, in a retrospective, obviously, we've brought it up a couple of times. This game has to be seen in the light of contextually how our society and culture was the time. So there is stuff that is very crass today that was seen as kind of more of like a one liner punch joke at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the time where shows like South Park and Simpsons and those kind of more crass humor shows reign supreme yes and and there was still a lot of stuff that needed to be figured out in society but if i'd give it a rating i would give it uh what was his name king dick cheese or something third yeah give it out of him he should have been in the game (laughs) um definitely should have been there that's a great character to add um not enough variety in the poo, I would say. I would say you need to add it, like a little bit uh, uh, more to it. I think there was room for pooey. I personally, uh, I think Derek agrees with that too. Um, I do. For for them to be cut is is kind of ridiculous it, on my part. I think that was a titular character that could have could have spawned future spinoff Conquers titles. But hey, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, my friend. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and that's what I give it. I give it a hindsight out of ten, which is actually out of twenty twenty for the future, which was a couple years ago. 
Also, I mean, Pooey was one of the six drug rats. Are you kidding me? That's genius. Listen, it, it hits both worlds, rats and poo. Solid. Or liquid, depending on what's going on. Um, anyway, that, of course, starts to bring us to the end. So, Derek, please take us away <laughs> from my terrible poop jokes, and let's end this thing. <sighs> Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall, Derek Baker. Our intro and outro music was written and recorded by our friend Evan Barr. And our new lovely artwork, new-ish at this point, been around for, for a little bit of time, but that was given to us by our friend Aaron Shattuck. Lovely people, as always. And as always, I want to thank those members of our Patreon uh, who have made this podcast possible for years and years. Uh, it's been an amazing journey through it. And if you want to check us out, we've got some amazing things with bonus content, bonus episodes, our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, our Minecraft server, our physical rewards, and our digital rewards. Uh, please check it out. And as always, I want to thank a few select members with Sky the Bear, Mr. Choff, Nick Hyman, Mick Chief, Climbing Spork, Mr. 1898, and Lee Tom John. So thank you all very much. If you haven't yet, give us a follow on Instagram or Twitter. We're also on Discord. It's free to join. Alex and I are hanging out in there all the time, having fun. Talk about new stuff coming up with the podcast. Talk about, of course, our uh, Minecraft server. We've got D&D, stuff like that available for patrons. You can get more details in the Discord server, and we'd love to see you there. And as always, you can check us out over on Twitch TV or Twitch. I, I said that the most awkward way possible. Uh, you can check me out at boomer.com, apparently. Uh, but you can check <laughs> me out also over at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That is twitch.tv slash s o u r m a n 70. And Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That's twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. Boomer.com is a boomer consulting site so do not go there <laughs> if you haven't <laughs> if you uh, this is all derailed now listen listen it's all this over. is what happens when you get old. our podcast is available on itunes spotify everywhere if you haven't yet please leave us a review it helps us out a lot thanks <laughs> i'm losing my brain all right as we walk our way over to our old folks home thank you for checking out Conquer's Bread Fur Day. Uh, did you guys play it growing up? Do you think the humor lives up to it? Now is a little too much now. Do you want to see more of these like fourth wall breaking games? Or are we done with it? Should we bury this type of game forever in the 20 knots? Let us know. And again, as always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I'm your host, Mr. Pooey. And this has been Finish the Fight a gaming podcast.